many of you know, I've just come back from teaching overseas, mostly teaching in Ipo, halfway between Kuala Lumpur and Penang, New Malaysia, teaching a nice retreat. <clears throat> It's just so nice being a monk, having the opportunity just to go there and just meditate and do a little bit of teaching. I really enjoy this life. Even I enjoy coming here of an evening just to give a Dhamma talk. Whereas many people would get terrified of not only facing 300, maybe 50 people, but facing the camera as well. This talk goes all over the world. Now, many people see all that just public speaking and just in front of a few people will be bad enough. But imagining without any notes, without any preparation, not knowing what you're going to say, talking to so many people and to the world. But the point is, somehow or another, in the training I've had as a monk for all these years, you just take this with your in your stride, you take it with ease. There seems to be no <coughs> fear or anxiety in what you do in life. And so when somebody asked me this evening, can you please give a talk on anxiety? I thought, hmm, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think I can sort of imagine and go back to my past on times when there was anxiety. And actually to understand where it comes from and how it's dealt with. And especially that there's a type of anxiety which I've heard is getting more and more prevalent in our modern world. The huge anxiety, the panic attacks, which come at times when you hardly expect them, and times when you feel just so at ease, but then suddenly this panic attack comes and leaves you completely disabled, not knowing what to do, and completely confused. So... Why are these panic attacks, extreme anxieties, getting more and more common in our modern world? And, moreover, what can we do about them? And understanding what we can do about them and where they come from also starts to unlock some of the great teachings of Buddhism, the ways to create this wonderful peace and happiness in the mind, which is not just for the sake of enjoyment when you are meditating, but which is far more powerful than that which starts to like, heal and solve these great problems which people face in our modern life. And all these little problems, the Buddha called this is like symptoms of suffering. And these can all be helped. They can be eased until they finally disappear and you're at peace and you're happy no matter what you're doing. So this is what Buddhism promises. And one of the things which I've been trying to do over the last... Um, many years now when I've been teaching, is actually to try and get these great teachings of the Buddha and apply them to these problems of modern life. And tonight, anxiety. So look how anxiety, you're going to get hammered today. After this Dhamma talk, anxiety, or actually the beginning, anxiety should sell, itself should be very anxious of what I'm going to say. Your days are numbered, anxiety. <laughs> oh, of course. Now, we've got the ordinary little fears which come up in our life, and many of us have those. But one of the ways to counter the fears which we have in life is understanding, first of all, use a bit of wisdom. Because Buddhism is very, very strong just on wisdom. And then, after wisdom, if that doesn't work, we come to just why that wisdom doesn't work. Just the nature of our uh, mind, which doesn't really perform its jobs properly, hasn't been trained properly, like a computer which crashes, or like a car which doesn't work properly. You get the, the uh, mechanic in to fix it. And now you've come to the great mechanics of the mind, the Buddhist monks. This is better than the RAC, this is the BAC. The Buddhist... Uh, hey, what's the Buddhist? Uh, I think it's something which begins with A. <laughs> think the anxiety control, or whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> so this is actually how we overcome these problems. But first of all, like, I always sometimes get a bit confu uh, not confused, but surprised. Why do people have anxiety these days? What have you got to be anxious about these days? I mean, what could possibly go wrong in your life? The worst that could happen to you is you die. So what? You've done that before. And one of the great things about Buddhism, when you believe in reincarnation, 
If you're about to die, it's not just, ah, I'm dying. All it is is, here we go again. Now, I mention that because one of the reasons people have anxiety sometimes is because we haven't got the proper view, the wide view. And my goodness, look, there is proof of reincarnation. The evidence is out there. And anybody who comes and says, show me the proof, show me the proof, say, I'll show you the proof if you really want to see it. But most people don't want to see it. They're stuck in their old ideas. And because of their old, old ideas, too often it means that we have to take the consequences of that literally narrow-mindedness which sees this life as the only life. And it can be anxious then. It can be full of fear. My goodness, if you don't get it right, you've only got one shot at it. If you, you know, if you mess up and stuff up this life, that's it. It's all gone. You've only had one chance. But isn't it wonderful? You can always have another go next time. All of you, if you don't get the right husband this life, maybe next life you <laughs> you make a better choice. <laughs> we don't get any husband at all. Maybe next life you can get a better one. But then be anxious about it. Because a, a lot of anxiety or fear is like a limited options. We've only got limited options. We've only got a few things which might happen. It has to happen this way. When we limit our options, we limit the possibilities. Of course, that increases our anxiety. One of the things about mindfulness and wisdom, it means you've got more options, more things can happen. Okay, so if you miss your plane, how many people get anxious about missing their plane? How can you miss your plane? It's great. You know, you can give, you know, this is what people are telling me in Singapore. If you miss your plane back to Perth, that's great. You can give another talk in Singapore. I thought it was a very good idea. That's why I told them, no, because I've got to go back. Because all the time, what they do, this is what happens in Singapore. And all the people in Singapore listen to this on the, on the video. You keep giving me all this breakfast, because the plane which goes from Singapore to Perth leaves in the morning. You give me all this, and they keep feeding and feeding and feeding me. Hoping I'm not, you know, looking at the time. If I do look at the time, then I say, I've got to go to the departure gate. Look, the plane's leaving in half an hour. Oh, okay. So they go there, and on the way they ask me, can I ask you this question about meditation? And can we ask you this question? And when you get to the gate, and it's only about 20 minutes, then he goes, uh, can I take last photographs, please? Another photograph, one photograph. And it came to the place once. I was the last one on the plane once. They almost got away with their secret plan to keep me there for another day. But the point was, you don't get anxious. Okay, so you missed the plane. I did miss the plane once. I remember I was visiting Thailand. And I hadn't been there for a long time. And so, you know, I was, uh, this was a monastery where I grew up in. I spent nine years there. And so, just when I was about to go to get the plane back to come to Perth, you know, all the monks and many of the, the lay people, they came to, to the monastery to see me off. And I had a special little, almost like a monk party. It's very hard to imagine what a monk party was, but whatever was allowable in the afternoon, that's what we ate. And then everybody had a nice ceremony. It's really nice to see you again, Ajahn Brahm. It's been so lovely the last week or two with you. And have a nice time in Australia. Give my best wishes to this one. Give my best wishes to that one. And they saw me to the car and they waved me off. And when I got to the airport, I missed my plane. So I had to come round again and come back. And that was really funny. Because as soon as I came back in the morning, they said, hey, we sent you off a few minutes ago. They said, yeah, well, I'm back again. Another party tomorrow, please. <laughs> very embarrassing. <laughs> We've already got rid of you. Please go away. You turn up again afterwards. But never mind, so what? You can always get another play the next day, or you can stay there, who cares? The point is that when we limit our options about what might happen next, that increases our anxiety, that increases our fear. Because we think, if we doesn't work out this way, then it's going to be terrible. We're not going to survive. Things are going to go desperately wrong. So when you have wisdom, you find out there's huge number of options which might happen to you. And some of the best things in life are always what happens when things go wrong. I just this evening, there was you know, one of my friends, Kanye was a very good friend because he's the dean of the cathedral at St. George's, you know, the dean John Shepherd. It's nice ever seeing him every now and again, asking him what's going on. The last time I saw him, he was very happy because he supports the, the, uh, the bombers and the bombers are just beat Fremantle, so he's very happy. I think he should be thrown out of Perth if he doesn't support Perth team, but never mind. I'm tolerant. But anyhow, 
he just invited me to give a talk somewhere. And I remember many years ago when I gave, we were doing an interfaith service at St. George's Cathedral. And if ever you've been to interfaith services, most of them are just so boring. And just they're so dull that, you know, if you don't fall asleep, the only reason why we have to keep doing these ceremonies of having this loud choral music is to keep people awake. And this was one of these boring services. Everyone was just doing this little chant and standing up and sitting down and going on and on. And then I saw this policeman came you know, from the side gate and talked to the, the dean. And then he interrupted the service. He got on the microphone and said, there's been a bomb threat. Some fundamentalist idiot had gone on the phone and said that you shouldn't have people from other religions in St. George's Cathedral, that's a sacred Christian church, and they put a bomb there. It's a bomb threat. And said, we've been told by the police we have to clear out the cathedral immediately in case there's going to be an explosion. And that was the time when everybody woke up. <laughs> it was the first thing I really listened to over the microphone. And so we all had to go outside while the police searched if there's any bombs in there. And of course, it was only just a threat, one of these idle threats. But it was the most wonderful interface service I've ever been to, simply because when we all got outside, we actually started talking to each other and cracking jokes and having fun together. It was actually fellowship there. It was the most wonderful time because it wasn't planned, it went wrong, and because it went wrong, it became human. And so we had a wonderful time. And afterwards, actually, I made a suggestion. He sort of put it up on when he gave his little speech at the end. We should do this every year. Simply because when things are choreogra choreographed, when they, they all go right, there's, there's a lack of like real humanity there. And because of that, there's no real love, there's no real joy, there's no real fun, there's no real adventure. So when things go wrong, I think this is the most wonderful time. I don't know if you know, she's not, she's not here this evening. He's not here. But this funeral which went wrong. I love funerals when they go wrong. There's a couple of great funerals. You don't have to be anxious about a funeral to make sure it all goes right. Because if it goes right, it's a terrible funeral. You forget that very easily. But when something goes wrong, you always remember that. I remember this one funeral where, we, actually, we were lowering the, it was a Chinese funeral, and they put too many knobs on the side of the casket because they wanted to make it look nice and expensive if it was for their mother or father and they wanted to do the very best. They had so many knobs on the side of the casket when they lowered it into the, coffin, into the hole, it got stuck. It got jammed halfway down. <laughs> you should have, seen, should have seen the looks of those funeral directors. That doesn't have to make anyone laugh. They usually look pretty serious, but this was real serious. <laughs> and I, as they were lowering it down, because I usually do a Buddhist chant as they lowered down the uh, the casket, and I had to keep doing it because when I was finished, they were still you know, struggling trying to get it up and down. So I went in two or three times. I kept going round and round and round the same chant to give them a chance to pull it out again. They managed in the end, thank goodness. But it was a wonderful funeral. It was another funeral which I went to that. You know that sometimes you go to a burial and afterwards, you know, you throw a little bit of earth into the, the hole there. That's a common thing to do. This one lady, she threw sort of a bit of earth, but she was carrying a handbag, and a handbag went in the hole as well. <laughs> it went clunk on the coffin. <laughs> and of course, everybody laughed. I'm sure the guy in the coffin also laughed. And it meant the seriousness of it went away. Everybody had a good laugh and they started. Some of these relations who hadn't talked to each other for years were now talking to each other. So when things go wrong, I think it's really wonderful. It makes it human. So you don't have to be anxious about anything because when it goes wrong, it actually goes better. As far as I'm concerned, it makes it a memorable occasion. What about marriages? How often just like the bride or the groom the night before get anxious. Actually, that's why they have to go and get drunk the night before, which is a stupid thing to do. If you were a Buddhist, you wouldn't need to get drunk. You wouldn't have any anxiety. Make it nice and peaceful and enjoy it. 
And if it goes wrong, again, it's, that's wonderful when it goes wrong. If you've ever been to a ceremony where things go wrong, you know, when somebody says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing, they, you know, they forget what the name of their loved one was. I think the last marriage ceremony I did, they forgot his name. So. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody reminded them and everyone started laughing. And again, it was human again. It was just because, because of a bit of nervousness. And as soon as people start laughing, where's the anxiety? It's all gone. You can't be anxious and laugh at the same time. And of course, life is what goes wrong. Now, I've somehow I've known this for a long time because I like to try and make people laugh when they're in sort of critical situations, you know, to actually crack a joke every now and again, simply because it takes away all the nervousness. And I even did this when I was a school teacher. Because as a school teacher, I was only a school teacher for a year, it became the time when it was the time for the examinations, the end of the year examinations. And I actually had to set one of the exams in maths. So that, you know, the headmaster said, no, you, you know, you've been teaching a couple of classes in this year, all year, you set the, the test paper. So I set the test paper, maybe because I was a bit rebellious even then, I put a joke in the exam paper. And I thought the headmaster would really sort of, you know, sort of send me in the corner and give me lines or something for putting a joke. But he actually encouraged me. He said, great, do this. And so I put a joke in the examination paper simply because I know what it was like being a kid going to school and facing examinations at the end of the year as if it was a matter of life and death. And people were so nervous. And sometimes people get panic attacks when they have examinations. But the great thing was I was the, the invigilator. You know, I had to sit on the stage here to watch that, make sure that no one was teaching, uh, cheating. But I wasn't actually watching for them to, whether they were cheating. I was watching and waiting for them to come to that question where the joke was and see what would happen. That was really good fun. And I was looking and looking and sure they got to that question. And the people would, <laughs> would move their head away. What's this? Did they read this right? There's a joke in the examination paper. And then they knew who wrote it, so they looked at me and I had this big smile. And they giggled. And then they went back to the examination paper. And it was a wonderful thing to do to give uh, a bit of relaxation to kids when they were starting examination. Because when I said a joke there, it wasn't so blooming serious anymore. And what is the big point about examinations and tests and things like that? As I've mentioned, I know I get a lot of flack back from parents about this. But in life, you have to keep on doing examinations and tests until you finally p fail one, and then you can stop. If you fail it early, you can stop earlier. <laughs> so that's how I look at the different options in life. So what happens? What happens? You know, it doesn't matter what happens. There's always a way around it, and there's always something interesting and useful which comes out of things. So the first thing about like anxiety and fear is actually give yourself more options. So it's not that it has to happen this way. It must happen this way. And if it, does, if it doesn't go this way, if it doesn't go as I plan it, then it's going to be terrible. It's going to be a disaster. If you give yourself more options, you find what once you thought was going to be a disaster, and that very thought, the idea, was the cause of your anxiety, you realize it's not a disaster either, after all. In fact, it's always you know, grist for the mill. It's dog poo for the mango tree. It's always you know, something which gives a texture to life. What goes wrong in life is what you always remember. And it gives, you know, you laugh at it afterwards. And it gives a sense of humanity. A real life is what goes wrong. And it gives life this beautiful tense sense of uh, unexpectancy, um, adventure, interest, and even joy. But the people who survive in life, the people who are successful in life, are the ones who can adapt, who can accept, learn, move on, and make use of all the things which go wrong in life. But the trouble is, I might stay there, but still, sometimes it just doesn't work. You say, yeah, I know that intellectually, but I still get afraid. I know it's only just a little examination. I know it's only like a driving test. I know it's only just an interview. There's many interviews I can do afterwards. But why do I always get so anxious? and so afraid, and why do I get these panic attacks? 
And I think one of the reasons is is because our modern life, the way we've used our mind, we've actually celebrated fear. We watch movies which make us scared. We go to theme parks with these death drops which make us scared. We'd actually like to know to listen to ghost stories which make us really scared. Shall we turn down the lights now and tell a ghost story? No, we've done that before. The point is that we make ourselves so scared and our media sells fear. And because of that, that we've actually cultivated this anxiety as if this anxiety is the only way we can feel alive, that we can actually feel we're doing something, that we are something. As if like anxiety feeds a sense of being. And that's exactly what the Buddha actually said. You know, that sometimes when we're afraid, when we have anxiety, it gives us like a cause and meaning to life. Which is why that some people, they like to climb Mount Everest. Why do they want to do that for? They just scare themselves. Why do they want to sort of drive these fast cars or fast motorbikes? What do you want to do that for? What do you get out of it? Just, you know, this feeling of being alive, being alert. Why do some people like to join armies? Why do they people like to go into to where the action is? And sometimes people like fear. And those are extreme cases of people who seek out fear in the very dangerous parts of our world or those dangerous experiences of the world. And because people, you can see that in those extreme people, see that in yourself, that sometimes you look out for fear, you seek fear. Why is that? A lot of times it is because we're afraid of peace. We're afraid of sometimes security, think we're dying in that security. Yeah, there's part of us which is dying, but another part of us which is really growing, the peaceful part of us, the kind part of us. We like to have fear because we want to run away from something. We like to have anxiety. And because people cultivate that so much in the world, sometimes they cultivate it and it becomes their stress. Sometimes people say, why do people have stress? Because they want stress. They're afraid of just relaxing and being peaceful. They think if they're not doing anything, if they're not living life on the edge, then what's the point? Again, it's because they don't know what the point of life truly is. <laughs> and the point of life, you should know, is like that beautiful peace, that stillness, a place where compassion, real kindness, can truly grow and can spread out to others. But you don't get that peace and that compassion through anxiety and fear. You understand that actually fear, anxiety, usually creates a lot of aggression, even violence. Aggr <laughs> aggression with your mouth and also violence with people's fists and guns, all coming from fear. And why do we have that fear? Because we like that fear. We feed on that. And because we feed on that, that for some people, They've been feeding their mind with fear and anxiety for so long that sometimes it goes over the top. When people told me of what panic attacks truly are, which can happen in a supermarket, which can happen at home, which can happen when you're just sitting here in a Buddhist society when there's nothing to be afraid of at all. Of all places in the world, this is the, the most safe, calm, peaceful place you can possibly get. But still people get these panic attacks. Why? All it is is some conditioning from the past. They've been building up this fear. They've been building up the momentum and it's just waiting to burst forth like an avalanche, like all this snow of fear deposited on the side of the mountain and just a small trigger is all it takes. An insignificant event. And the great panic attack falls like an avalanche completely out of control. Once you see where the cause lies, it's not a cause of just before that panic attack came. It's what you've been doing the whole of your life, the days and the months beforehand, the stressful life, the worry. People like to worry. You know that as a monk you don't watch TV, but every now and again when I went to go and visit my mother, I would just sit with her and watch some of these TV programs which people watched. I remember having been a monk for nine years in Thailand, going to see my mother and seeing the first TV program since nine years. And I couldn't believe just what happened. I forget what 
movie it was and what series it was. It was there's some sort of like special detectives in London. Only a half an hour, you know, weekly series. But in that half an hour, I counted how many people had been killed. It's about 12. That's about one death every two and a half minutes. And I thought, what's going on here? Because I was a monk and I came from like a very calm and peaceful background, I saw that and I noticed just how much violence and how many people died in this like, you know, TV um, series in just half an hour. But for people who watch those sorts of things every week, it was normal, it was natural. They became inured to that fear because all those movies are trying to get that fear up, trying to get you um, uh, clinging to the side of the armchairs, trying to move those emotions of fear. And people were enjoying that. And the worry which people have, why is it that people watch all these soap operas like Neighbours or... What's the other one? Semmerdale Farm, Home and Away. I don't know what's your... Bold, the bold and the beautiful. We should start a, a, a soap opera, like the, no, no, the, the monk and the, the lay supporter or something. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I, I know that in the, uh, the plane coming back from Singapore, I saw there was an article about Batman. We've got a new Batman movie coming out. And I I just noticed they, they've they done Batman so many times. Superman's been done to bits. Spider-Man is already there. The one they haven't done, the one superhero which I read when I was a young monk in Thailand, it was a comic strip in Thai, Super Monk. Mm. <laughs> now, anybody who knows anybody in Hollywood... You get this franchise for the Super Monk series because it's an amazing thing. This Super Monk, he would have all these psychic powers, and that's where he got the powers from for meditation. And he go flying through the air. He uses to be, stop a train so people don't get run over. Could uh, read a terrorist mind straight away and tell them the bombs over there because he could read people's minds. And could do all these incredible things. But also at the end, we get this wonderful Dharma message, like you know, like anger doesn't you know not. Uh, you don't overcome anger with anger. You don't overcome violence with violence, terrorists. You do it with peace and forgiveness. And in the end, everybody's happy and peaceful and meditating together. Wouldn't that be a wonderful TV series? Or, you know, a new franchise for Hollywood? Forget Batman, forget Spider-Man, Super Monks! <laughs> so, anyway, how did I get onto that from this fear? <laughs> oh, that's right, yeah, just about sort of uh, anxiety. People actually want to get upset and they want to get afraid. Now, okay, that's all right in sort of moderation, but I think it's because that we see so much frightening things, whether it's on the TV or in the newspapers or whatever else, because we feed on such fear, for many people, their fear tolerance gets so overwhelmed that sooner or later, just that the way of looking at the world becomes fearful. It just becomes a bad habit of the mind. And we see fear where there shouldn't really be any fear whatsoever. And because of that, that sometimes people just go over the limit and they get into panic attacks. So how do we stop that? If you're someone who has panic attacks, instead of watching those violent movies, or those uh, uh, ones which make you really afraid, the terror movies, you just watch, you know, sort of... Uh, Friday night at Damaloka, live. Watch a video of Ajahn Brahma or Sister Wayam or something like that, because it calms you down, makes you peaceful and still. So when you actually train yourself to see beautiful things, you know, like go to the beach, you know, you know search out for peaceful things, for calming things, not for exciting things, not for things which, you know, get your adrenaline running. You know, don't go to sort of uh, these speedways or you know, Formula One or something. There's always a car turning over in flames. And... Instead of doing calm, beautiful things. And if you start doing calm and beautiful things or just listen to calming, beautiful music, you're actually reprogramming your mind against that excitement and that fear which will calm you down. And if you really want to go deeper, then do the Buddhist meditation, which actually gives us beautiful perspective. Most people, I've found, 
have calmed their panic attacks by simply sitting down and just making the mind rest, rested. Leaving the mind alone, just calm down. Give yourself a few moments of peace. So the mind isn't always just looking for fear and feeding on fear as a way of life. How many people actually feed on that excitement of fear? On fast cars? On fast monks? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> so, when we understand that's actually where that comes from, actually you can start doing something about it, to have a more tranquil, more peaceful life, to look for that tranquility, look for that peacefulness, to reprogram your mind. But if you're stuck for the time being and you have panic attacks, you're anxious, there's another way, and I just mentioned it, this reprogramming the mind business. I've had great fun teaching this over the last uh, six months or so. It's almost like the, uh, the flavor of the month at the moment, just how to pro reprogram your mind. If you're some t someone who always does get these anxiety attacks, and find out you know, roughly what the triggers are you know, when you're going for an interview or you're meeting a new person or you've got a new client or you have to sort of go on an aircraft for the first time, whatever it is, which is you think is going to make you anxious. If it's become your habit, you can't do anything at the time. You can't say to yourself, if this is your habit of mind, just before you get on the plane, I'm being stupid, no, planes don't drop out of the sky these days, you know, why am I getting anxious? You find that make you more anxious, you try and control that force which has become a habit in you. At the moment, <laughs> when anxiety comes up, it's a habit, you can't do much about it. What you can do is before the emotion comes up, that's when you can do something. It's what I call like programming your mindfulness. And I've been using this so often in so many different ways of you know, people's problems in their life. The important thing about programming mindfulness is you choose a time when it's not a problem. Not when you're facing anxiety, but when you're a long way away from it. Because this was the meaning of this old Chinese proverb, which I heard a long time ago. They say, love the tiger but at a distance. I love the tiger, but at a distance. And what I thought was that was, you know, make sure that you're a physical distance a long way from the tiger when you love them. If you go close and try and pat them on the head, you might lose your hand and a lot of other parts of your body as well. So loving the tiger at a distance, well, first of all, I thought it meant a geographic distance, space. But I thought, no, no, what that means is time. So love the tiger, the problems of your life but not while you're facing them, because when you're facing them, become a creature of habit, you react in the old ways. A long time before that problem is going to arrive, then you start loving it. You act when you're rested, when you're relaxed, when the emotions aren't strong and aren't overpowering you. I call this programming mindfulness. So if it's a case of anxiety, when you're relaxed, when you're rested, when there's no problem on the horizon at all, you simply say to yourself three times, when I'm in that situation, I will not be afraid. When I'm in that situation, I will not be anxious. Whatever the words are, which mean something to you, telling yourself, I will not be anxious when that happens. And you leave it. When you listen, when you're relaxed, when there's no sort of agitation of the mind, that program goes in. And it's incredibly powerful. Like, this is why I've been telling it to so many people. Do it, do yourself, do it yourself therapy, I call it. Because what it means is you put that information in and you'll be surprised what happens. You're in that situation, it starts to happen and unfold, where usually you'd go into this old habit of fear and anxiety and uh, control. And instead, because of this program you put into the mind earlier on, that comes up, it becomes an automatic response, you take the new path. I would not get anxious. And then you just relax. The point is, at the time, you can't do anything. You have to put in that program hours beforehand. 
is called Ajahn Brahm's Anti-Anxiety Virus. The antivirus for anxiety. You can go into your computer, of your mind, your emotional world, and stop these terrible worms of anxiety which eat away at your happiness. And very often, not often, but almost always, it works so well. You're just reprogramming your habits because these are habitual responses which sometimes we make. They're not really worthwhile. <laughs> They're not appropriate to the stages of the situation and we can actually do something about it. But more than that, not just reprogramming your mindfulness, when you make your mind softer with meditation, when your mind is very, very soft, it's like a sponge. You can sort of drop it in the ground. It doesn't shatter. Another thing with anxiety attacks is like this... You know, dropping a glass on the ground, of course it will break and shatter because it's just so hard. And people's minds become just so hard, they're brittle. Which means little things again create this panic and, a, and anxiety attacks as if your mind is shattering at this particular time when you have a panic attack or an anxiety attack. And why is that? Because your glass is too hard. Your mind has been too stiff. Soften it for goodness sake. Which is why we meditate and just make the mind so soft and nice and be kind and be so peaceful and gentle. This poor little mind, you've had given such a hard time. Oh, you poor little thing, you've made you work so much and you're so asking and demanding of this mind. Oh, you poor. <laughs> so if you could do something like that to your mind, you give it so much gentleness and peacefulness, it starts to relax. A little bit of kindness, gentleness, loving kindness, compassion, care, well-wishing, gentleness. That does an enormous amount to soften your mind. How many times are we just so hard and so absolutely cruel to ourselves? Pushing ourselves so hard. No wonder we get so stiff inside. Are you just so demanding and critical of yourself? never thinking you make a good job of whatever you do. Sometimes we're just so critical of ourselves, we push ourselves so hard, we demand so much of ourselves, our mind gets so stiff and hard, it's so brittle that one more little thing which goes wrong and we explode. The symptoms of a hard, brittle mind are anger. When you get angry at other people, when you lose your patience, it means your mind isn't soft enough, it's got too hard, so you need to soften it a bit. Well, if you soften the mind a bit so it's nice like sloppy clay, so it just goes all over the place, you know, people can punch it, it never leaves a, an impression on you. It'd be something like that, nice and soft and gentle and peaceful. And you can do this. And that's why sometimes people get upset at monks and we just forget about it. And sometimes they come up and ask forgiveness afterwards. They ask forgiveness for what? Don't you realize what I said about you? No. I never heard it. So sometimes it's fun to abuse a monk, because the monk just sits there. Yeah, it's very kind of you to actually have the, the time to talk to me and call me camel face. I never realized you even noticed me. <laughs> That's the only term of abuse I've been using these days. <laughs> sometimes when I went to, to, uh, to, to uh, Malaysia, people said I've put on weight, I've got fatter. I said, yes, because Buddhism is growing in Australia, so am I. <laughs> so in other words you don't take offense you know you just so whatever happens whatever happens you know you're just soft and lovable and people try to you know to wind you up you just refuse to get wound up and so because of that you know you've got this beautiful soft mind and it's just impossible to get angry so everyone knows it's a waste of time getting angry and upset or getting anxious and being feared. All these negative emotions are a sign that your poor old mind hasn't been looked after. That you're too hard and you're just too resisting of life and you just can't take much more afterwards. That's why a little bit of peace in your life, a little bit of gentleness, a little bit of quietness makes you more tolerant more tolerant to life going not the way you plan it to go. When you're at peace and still, doesn't matter what happens, it's good enough. You can always do something with it. 
But when you have no peace in your heart, you find you're much more demanding of the future. Your options are much narrower. It has to be this way. Because you've got no softness and tolerance. So you find when people just do lots of peaceful, gentle, quiet meditation, get so relaxed, so still, you can't get anxious, you can't get angry. You can't get upset about anything anymore. That's why the, my monks in my monastery, they know this, I shouldn't have told them, but they always, when they want to ask for something, they want to ask to go here or to buy this or do that, they always like to look at me and find out when I'm nice and peaceful and soft and kind. And that's when they ask me these things. And that's what you should do with a partner in life. If you want to buy a nice dress and your husband hasn't got enough money, ask him after he's had a nice meditation. And you go, oh, yeah. May all sentient beings be happy? Oh, certainly, dear. <laughs> but the point, if you, you know, if you're a husband, you want to go and watch the West Coast Eagles or whatever it is, and it's very busy, just... After your wife has been to the in the morning down and done a bit of meditation, so if I go, oh yeah, sure. Because it's true when you have peace and happiness in your heart, you don't get angry, you don't get upset, you're more tolerant, you're more at ease. When you're more at ease with life, not only do you don't get these negative emotions coming up, but you don't get the anxiety and the fear afterwards. The anxiety and fear is, a la is obviously coming from the stress which people have in their life. They just don't know how to relax, to be at peace and enjoy themselves. We should have more fun in life. People are far too serious. I've already mentioned weddings should be far more fun, not too serious. Do it the other way around. You know, don't always do it the same thing. Put the rings on the, on the toes or something instead of on the wedding finger, whatever. With one, you have to have a wedding ring. So I don't know what particular finger is. I never got married. I wouldn't know anyway. But put it on a toe or something. <laughs> make it a little bit different and make it fun. And funerals as well. Make that fun. And everything else you do in life. If it's you know, a examination, make it fun. An interview, make it fun. Look, if you go into an interview for a new job, and you make your interviewer laugh, they're probably going to want to sort of hire you, simply because you're fun to work with. And they also know that you know how to overcome stress, you're light-hearted. You, you know, in this modern working world, there is so much stress, so much demanded of you, and now the interview is almost like a test of how much you can deal with stress. And if you can be really relaxed in an interview, then maybe that might be giving the message to your prospective employer that this guy, this girl, is so relaxed at an interview, maybe they know how to cope with the stress in their working environment. Maybe they can work hard because they're relaxed. So when one can learn how to relax in that way by training your mind in meditation, and please never think that meditation is hard work. It's completely opposite of hard work. In the retreats which I've been giving over in uh, Ipro, I keep on saying this, always look at that temple, by the, when Ajahn Brahm is at a teaching retreat, it's always called Club Med. Club Med Ipro, Club Meditation Ipro. Simply because it gives, pe it gives people the idea that this is fun. This is relaxation, this is like a holiday. And if you understand that meditation is not hard work, completely the opposite, stop it, not doing anything, not trying, not trying to get somewhere, not trying to control things. That's what you do in work. And that creates the stress which creates the anxiety. How many of you have been working just hard all day? Trying to do something, trying to sort of meet some sort of goals and you know, people's expectations. It's so hard. And if you carry on like that in meditation or in you know, any religious spiritual path, you, know, you are going to get more stressed out, you're going to get more anxious. But if you can actually just relax in meditation, even if you fall asleep, don't get anxious about falling asleep. You're allowed to fall asleep when you meditate. That's why I tell people on retreats, if you, you know, get tired, then go and have a rest, lay down. We call that in Buddhism, meditating flat out. Mm. Well, 
you can tell your boss, you know, if you want to take a rest, you know, I've just been working flat out, boss. <laughs> but the point, the point is you're learning how to just relax. And that's so important. Because if our world doesn't learn how to relax, you'll never have a sense of humor. You'll never be able to laugh. You'd be so serious. You'd get anxiety attacks. You'd do the wrong thing at the wrong time. You get so stiff. When you're driving a car, you get so anxious that because of your anxiety, you make accidents happen and everything goes wrong. I remember as a kid, the first time I got a bicycle, I was so anxious that I'd fall off. I gripped the handlebars so hard. I was so stiff, I kept on falling off. The anxiety caused me to fall off. Because you all know if you're going to ride a bicycle or a motorbike or even you know, drive a car, you have to relax. If you're so stiff, your just body just cannot respond to the needs of the moment. And that's just a metaphor for life. Anxious people become so stiff they can't respond to the needs which come up unexpectedly every moment. And that's actually why I never plan my talks. I don't want my talks to be rigid. I want it just to respond to just the moment, whatever you know, comes into your mind. And when it responds to the moment, just like you'd never fall off on a, motor, on a motorbike or a bicycle, because you're always balanced, because you're relaxed, or like the little kid who falls off the third story, they bounce, they never hurt themselves because the body completely relaxes. By relaxing, so many wonderful things happen. So even when you go to the dentist, you just relax. And I do relax when I go to the dentist, simply because the dentist chair is the most comfortable chair that a monk is ever allowed to sit on. He goes, right, Dad, it's just so nice. And number two, the other reason why I like to go to a dentist, because I've got so many things in my mouth for once I cannot talk. You can ask me all the questions in the world, I will not be able to answer. Just go, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> So there's a small price to, you know, the, the drill in your mouth or whatever, there's a small price to pay for that beautiful, lovely chair. So the... <laughs> The point is you don't get anxious about anything. And that's, I'm not just saying that, that's actually true. There was that case about, was it 12, 14 years ago now, when we had a big bushfire over in uh, Serpentine. A big bushfire came to our monastery, huge. It was the hottest day of the year ever recorded in Western Australia at the time. This big bushfire came through. Massive trees were exploding like bombs going off. And it was really dangerous. I mean, this was really dangerous stuff. People die in bushfires. But we fought the fire. We were told to evacuate. And after being evacuated, I was interviewed by the, the news, on the evening news. I said, well, you're scared? Oh, no, it's only a bushfire. <laughs> and so well, if you did die anyway, it's a, it's a great way to die because you don't have any cremation costs. It all comes with a package. And like many Buddhists, they want the ashes to be spread over our monastery, it's spread over there at the same time. That's real efficiency. We always wanted to build a crematorium on our monastery, now we had one. <laughs> that's the point. But that sort of attitude, you're not afraid of anything. It's always a positive spin to whatever happens. But the interesting thing was that that person who interviewed me, they called up a couple of weeks later. And it was like a, one of these you know, women who fronts the news, you see them on the news in the evening interviewing people. She said, look, I can't get you out of my head, she said, simply because I've interviewed so many people. This is my profession, and you're the first person I see who wasn't afraid of what had just happened. You weren't anxious. And for me, it was just normal, but that was the time when all my training in meditation and Buddhism, someone saw that. And so what had happened when you were in a tough situation, in a life-threatening situation, you just weren't anxious at all. And she noticed that and thought it was really weird and strange. So you know, this is actually what happens. I remember just a few weeks later, Curtin University Department of Psychology came along. They gave us interviews, each person who'd been in the fire, to see what our stress was and the, the traumatic results of, of what happened. 
I think they threw away those reports afterwards because they just didn't compute. Because <laughs> most monks, you don't get trauma from these things. Just let them go. You don't have anxiety attacks. You don't wake up at night thinking of fires. I just have a nice night's sleep. I'm, I'm not going to spoil my night's sleep just for thinking about a blooming fire. No way. <laughs> so the the point is, you this actually does work. You do overcome anxiety. You do overcome fear. And again, to sum up the reason why it does this, because the wisdom gives you more options. You're not narrowed with a couple of um, options which you think this is going to happen. It's going to be terrible. I've got these two options. It's going to go my way. It's going to go another way. Ah, it's going to be terrible. Gives you more options. Whatever happens, it's going to be okay. The worst thing was having you die, you just get reborn again. Have another try next time. So what? Big deal. Yeah. And number two is you learn just uh, to maybe program your mindfulness as a stop measure before true wisdom and peace comes up. And number three, just relax a bit more. Just give yourself a few moments of peace and quiet in your life to make your mind nice and soft and gentle and like a sponge. People are just too hard and too stiff these days in their minds. There's a cause of stress, makes huge problems with your health, creates arguments and anger. You can't laugh as much. And next, you know, you get anxiety attacks and you get afraid when you really shouldn't be afraid. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of. So when you do a little bit of meditation, make your mind soft and peaceful and kind. And don't make the meditation hard. Soft and kind, peaceful meditation. The gentle meditation. You'll find that those panic attacks, they just don't come up. They disappear. You're free of them. And you find what usually would make you afraid. <laughs> it's just no need to be afraid. You're soft. And that soft means you're tolerant. Life can poke you and it leaves no dents. Life can hit you, and you don't shatter. Whatever happens in life, you go through life like this soft, bubbly, nice little ball of fluff, <laughs> rather than this very expensive, hard crystal ball, which is always breaking and shattering at every event which happens in life. So, that's a little advice on how to deal with anxiety in your life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, now, any questions about anxiety? And don't be anxious to ask questions. Anyone got any questions or comments about anxiety and panic attacks? Yeah. Yeah, about a few months ago, it's from like a Okay, the tsunami and the effects on many of the Sri Lankan people. I was only there for a couple of days, so I can't really go from personal experience, but uh, I do know from general experience that many people who live in the third world countries can cope with such uh, trauma much, much better than we in our Western countries. And I know from the governor of Kandy, who I met and talked to, he said, please, please tell people not to send any more therapists and counsellors. And that's what he told me. So obviously, the reason was, he said, the Sri Lankan people, especially the poor people living on those coastal communities, they had their own ways of dealing with the problems because they lived so close to life and death. And they knew tragedy as part of life, whereas people in the West get so insulated from such things that when it happens, it becomes more shocking to us. They're more accepting of these things, and they learn to cope. So he said, that, you know, there's obviously a few people who didn't cope, but the vast majority of them were doing fine, thank you very much. They didn't need counsellors, they needed food, they needed clothing, they needed housing, that's all. They needed to get their life back together. But physically, emotionally, they were fine. And I think I've seen that in many other sort of countries. The simple people, because maybe they aren't exposed to uh, home and away. And 
the, the, the anxiety levels are very low. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble with any TV corporations today. Yeah. Because... Yeah, so they were sending people along to the, the monks for trauma counselling. Please leave me alone. I'm now going to get an anxiety attack. That I'm never going to get any sleep tonight. <laughs> nah. No, it's actually true because, you know, all these... One of the reasons why, you know, we do have, you know, religions like Buddhism, especially the old traditional types of Buddhism, because they worked. There's like a, almost like a natural evolution. If any of these teachings, you know, weren't really sort of uh, helpful, they just disappeared. Especially like Buddhism, when it wasn't imposed upon anybody, it was just like a nat natural vegetation, which wasn't planted, just grew by itself. And, oh, well, look, this... Uh, who was it? Somebody came to my monastery. Oh, no. It was this story about this guy who was years, years ago in Thailand. And he... I was... This is our monastery in northeast Thailand. Uh, he visitor came. He was a Thai man. And he came to see me. He asked if he could stay in the monastery for a few days. And I was at the abbot, but I was, you know, the first one he saw. So I said, oh, I can't see anything wrong with that. You know, you can stay over here. So he stayed there. He kept himself to himself. But he came to all the meetings, but never really talked to anybody. And so after three days, he wanted to go home. So because I was the one he first met, he came to me to ask permission to go home. So he said, sure. But if, well, now, why did you come here, I asked him. Because, you know, you're not, you're not really interested in talking like Buddhism with the monks. You haven't been doing much meditation. Why did you come here? And what he said, he said, look, before I came here, I had this terrible argument with my wife. <laughs> so I came to the monastery for three days. Now I feel better. I'm going home to see her. That's what I call Buddhist trauma counseling. <laughs> Sometimes you don't need to answer people's problems. You just need to give them a space of peace and safety so they can answer the problems themselves. That's what he did. Instead of going to a bar or going out with his friends or going to somebody else, he just came to the monastery, just had space for three or four days to calm down in a supportive, compassionate, peaceful environment. And then so you could see what needs to be done. Give yourself some softness and peace his mind became like, you know, like soft and fluffy. And all those things which he got arguing with his wife about was a big deal anyway. And she's my wife. There's only small things. You know the chicken and duck story. We argue about the stupid little things. And so he saw that when his mind became soft. So give yourself a little bit of peace. And all your anger just disappears. Be kind. And the anxiety in the world just disappears. So, this is actually, you know, what you're saying is true. They go to see the monks. But the monks don't really do anything. All they do is just give them peace and encourage them just to slow down, to be soft. And with that softness, they can take the traumas much more easily. They're not so hard and brittle. Any other questions before we finish off for tonight? Yes. How do you overcome about disappointing people who depend upon you? By realizing that the more anxious you get, the more likely you are to disappoint people. To realize the anxiety is actually contrary to its, its, uh, its origin. You, you, because you don't want to disappoint people, you get anxious. Because you're anxious, you don't perform to your uh, top limit, and therefore you do start disappointing people. So a little bit of wisdom comes up, say that ang ang the anxiety is uh, self-defeating in that way. You're trying hard to do your best, and because you're trying too hard and getting anxious, you're not, uh, you're not meeting your potential. It's just like, um, I saw the paper today, Leighton Hewitt is playing in the tennis. If he gets really anxious, he will lose. Every sports person knows you have to relax to be able to play your top game. But the more anxious we get, the more fearful we get, the more tense we get, the more likely it is we lose. So in order 
not to disappoint your supporters, you know, the people behind you, backing you, in order not to support to to disappoint the people depending upon you, for that reason I will not get anxious. So the more responsibility you have, the less freedom you have to be anxious, basically. So you have to deal with that anxiety and realize that relaxing is the best way to succeed and to, to do your very best. Does that make sense to you? Is that the question you're asking? Okay, because that's the answer you're getting. And I don't care about disappointing you. <laughs> so there we go. So thank you very much for all those questions and thank you also for the guts to ask questions. All of you who ask questions, if I you know, do make a bit of fun, and please it's not at you, it's just to liven things up here. And all the people who do ask questions, marvellous, well done. You are the cream of the people who come here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>